Hey everybody, welcome to Oasis Church Online. It's so awesome that you tuned in today. My name is Wes, I'm part of the staff team here at Oasis. And hey, today is going to be uh, maybe a little bit more of a unique Sunday because we are talking all about our partnership with Villages of Hope in Malawi and what the incredible things that are happening in that part of the world. And the cool thing is that whether, whether, wherever you're watching from in the world, you get to partner with us too. You got to support what's going on here and we're going to tell you more ways to do that uh, in a little bit. But, uh, we get, but if you want more details on that, check out our website under Malawi and you'll find that. And uh, hey, our services are going to uh, going to begin in just a moment. We thought this next song would be a great song to kick things off for today. So we'll see you back in just a moment.
everybody. Happy Sunday. Welcome to Oasis Church. Whether you are in this room with us, whether you are watching online with us, welcome here. My name is Wes. I'm part of the staff team here at Oasis. And man, the first time I heard that song, I rewound that cassette tape like a thousand times. So good. Um, hey, if you're wondering why we started off with that song today, because today we are talking about our partnership with Villages of Hope, Villages of Hope in Malawi. And so today's a little bit more, a little bit of a, a unique Sunday. But you know what? We feel our, 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 our role as a church is to help the poorest of the poor in the world. And in Malawi, that's what you're going to get. And we are partnering with an incredible organization called Villages of Hope. And today we're going to uh, hear some stories and, uh, and, and see what we have done these past few years and what we can do uh, in these coming years, coming, uh, this next season coming, and how you can partner with us to help with that as well. A um, few things to let you know about before we get started, and one of them is, I know some of you like to plan ahead, our Christmas Eve services that are coming up at Christmas time. Uh, we are going to be having five services, one on the 22nd, one on the 23rd, and three on the 24th. Uh, there's there's going to be childcare up to pre-K for, for everybody, uh, not everybody, uh, those of you who are under before kindergarten, so you cannot all go to childcare, okay. Um, but uh, this is a great time to invite your, your friends, uh, your family members, your neighbors to come to church this year. Uh, and on that, uh, there'll be no services on Christmas Day. And on the next week after that, uh, New Year's Day, January 1st, it will be an online only service. Um, so keep that on your calendar. Um, hey, we uh, this in two days, we are going to be uh, making turning this building into a little more festive for the Christmas season. So if you are free during the day, uh, in two days on Tuesday, we're going to be um, setting up some trees, decorations all around to make this place a little more festive for the holiday season. So if you're free that day, we're, we're going to provide lunch. You just uh, come here at about 9 a.m. They're going to start, and you can show up at the East Doors, and, they'll, and somebody will greet you, and they will walk you through. Uh, and we'd love to put you to work that day. Um, what else is going on here? Hey, we're kicking off a month of generosity starting next uh, next week, December 4th, and we're going to be partnering up each week for, with a few orga different organizations that are doing something, uh, some incredible things in this city. And next week, we're going to partner up with Crisis Pregnancy Center, and we're going to help them with the most needed items that they need. Um, th you can check the website for what they need, but some of those things are baby formula and diapers, kids' clothing and toys, amongst other things. And so what you're going to do, you're going to pick up those things this week, bring them here, uh, but don't bring them into the building. Leave them next Sunday uh, behind your vehicle in the parking lot and we will have a team come and uh, collect those things uh, when you walk into the building. Hey, all in all, we're going to be here together for about one hour together and we got a great band together. We got Alexa and Arnold and Lauren and Tim to sing with us and this first song that we're going to start singing is a song that the chorus that I probably first learned when I was about 14 years old and it's, it's, it's very simple but it's, it has some incredible truth. It speaks of uh, how, how despite what we're going through is that God is still incredibly good and he wants good things for your lives. So with that, I'm going to invite you to stand up and join the band as we sing. Yeah. 
Well, thanks so much for your singing. You can go ahead and take a seat. Um, as a kid, um, probably my favorite time of the year was uh, the Christmas season. You know, I loved uh, I loved Christmas time, and I always counted down the days uh, till we got to Christmas. You know, for me, I don't know my my heritage, but we opened up our Christmas presents on Christmas Eve, which was uh, awesome. Um, but I always counted days to that day, that evening. And one of the things that always helped me count down the days is that every year my mom and dad would get me one of these. Do you remember these? The little doors you open up and every day, you gotta, as you count down the days, you get a little piece of cheap waxy chocolate. Um, but I didn't know it as, at the time when I was a kid, but these calendars originated from something. And they originate, um, they date back to uh, a season called Advent. And today, today marks the first day of Advent. And, and the word uh, Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, meaning uh, arrival or, or, or appearance, or like, like something is coming. And it's, uh, it's the arrival of the most important person that's ever lived in history. It's Jesus. So as a symbol on this, the, 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 the first Sunday or the, whatever, the, the three or four, uh, four Sundays before Christmas, um, as a symbol that we are aware of what's happened in history, that Jesus came as a baby to this earth but not only that, it's that Jesus is also coming back again. So as a symbol, we, um, we light a candle. And we light a candle to say, God, we are anticipating your arrival and we are, you're not gonna find us sleeping, but we're gonna continue to do the work as we anticipate your arrival. Well, we also light a candle just to remind us that God is with us. When you hear that word around Christmas time, that word Emmanuel, that, that word means God is with us. I thought it was so fitting that um, today our focus being uh, our, with our village, our partnership with Villages of Hope in Malawi, and this being the first day of Advent, be, because that first Christmas when Jesus was born, the conditions that Mary and Joseph faced were very similar to the conditions that were in, that are in Malawi today. You know, that first Christmas in Bethlehem. There, there's poverty, there's pain, there's confusion, there's a, a corrupt government. But amidst all that, something happened. You know, and years and years before that event, the prophet Isaiah, he wrote in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 9, he said, he said, amidst all your darkness that you feel right now, there is a light that's breaking through. And that light is a child. That light is going to be a baby born unto you. And the government's going to be on his sh shoulders. And he's going to be the one that saves us. He's going to be the one that saves the world. And traditionally, the first candle that we light for Advent has been called the, the, the candle of hope. And today we're excited to show you some of the hope that we've been uh, helping with, uh, with, with, the, with the, what's, what's going on in Malawi, that these people that we're supporting and partnering with, they have so much more hope because of what God is doing over there through you and through this church. With this candle also represents the hope that you can have here. You know, maybe you're here that, and you don't, you don't really struggling with poverty, but you are going through a painful situation. I need to know today that God knows exactly what you're worried about. God knows what you're going through and he wants to be the light amidst your darkness as well. Hey, we have a tool for you. Um, it's called the Advent Guide and we've made this available the last couple of years and our family has made it a tradition. Uh, we're gonna start this tonight and we're, we're gonna get together and light a candle and we're gonna dim the lights, have some snacks and we're just gonna go through week one of this. And we, we, we take turns reading and, uh, but I think this is an incredible way to remember the Christmas story the way it was intended to remember. And as you're way, on your way out, you can pick these up at a little table next to the Malawi booth. So, and it's available online as well for those of you who are watching online. But hey, listen, for all of us Christ followers, no matter wh whether we're living here or far away, we have an incredible hope. And that hope has a name. And his name is Jesus. Or we can say, 
God, in the meantime, we're going to light a candle. And in the meantime, we're going to trust you and put our hope in you today. If we have a chance to sing about that right now, enjoy the band. Join us.
Why don't you join me as we pray? Um, God, there's that line that just, we just sang, that death has no claim over me, which is so true, it's so powerful, it's so hopeful, but yet there's so many other things because of you that don't have a claim on us either. That's fear, that's anxiety, that's depression. I pray we can bring all these things to you because you are our incredible hope because of what your son did on the cross. And as we turn our attention over to the scriptures and see what, we're, see what you're doing through us in other parts of the world, that you'll inspire us. We just thank you for everything that's happening. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for singing. Why don't you grab a seat? Well, right now we have a chance to continue our worship, but through giving this time. And hey, if this is your, um, this is your, one of your first times here, your guests here, uh, please don't feel obligated to participate in this part of the service. Let the service be our gift to you. Uh, but for those of you who call Oasis family or Oasis home, uh, give with this perspective. Uh, King David records, um, he records a prayer in, in the book of Chronicles, and he says this. He says, but who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? And he says this, he says, God, everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. You know, one of the reasons why we give back to God is that it's a reminder that says that, um, God, everything we make, everything we earn is 100% comes from you. And it's a reminder that when we, when we give back to you that we are saying, God, we are dependent on you. So we're going to give you a moment to do that now. Uh, thank you so much for your giving. There's a number of ways to give. Uh, thanks for your giving. Well, what a great introductory video made by uh, Jeremy and some of the members of our team that just lay out the fact that uh, we're facing a number of the greatest crises uh, in human history in our day, today. Uh, a lot of those are related to extreme poverty, and they are compounded by war and famine and disease, but uh, beyond the numbers and the statistics, it's, it's uh, hard to remember that these are real people, and these are real lives and real stories, 
And this is so significant to us as Christians because our leader, our, our master, Jesus, one time um, spoke of the future. And this is very sobering. It's very haunting. He spoke of coming judgment, that one day there would be a judgment. And often um, these words I'm going to reach in a moment, they're referred to as a parable. They're not actually a parable. They're just a picture. They're an analogy of what this judgment is going to be like. And he um, says this. This is Jesus speaking. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. And his is Jesus himself. He's doing that weird Refer to himself in the third person thing. And he will separate them as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Then the king, Jesus again speaking of himself, the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will say, what are you talking about? Like, when did we, when did we do, what do you mean? When, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty or give you something to drink, or naked and clothe you, prison and visit you? And the king will say to them, I assure you, when you did it to the least of one of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it to me. And then, uh, this is hard, and it's harder in our society, which doesn't like, um, you know, any moral judgments, but he says to those on his left, he says, hey, away from me. Enter into judgment, for I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. And I was thirsty, and you didn't give me anything to drink. And I, I was in prison, you didn't visit me. I was naked, you didn't clothe me. I was a stranger, you didn't welcome me in. And they say, when? You know, when did we do this? What are you talking about? We'd never turn our back on you, Jesus. And he will say, he will answer, I assure you, when you refused to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And they will enter into eternal punishment, uh, but the righteous will go into eternal life. And it's interesting that these are sobering words, these are strong words. And a a side note is some people have looked at this and said, okay, Jesus is saying, okay, where we go in the afterlife determines on, you know, our actions. And, And you have to take all of Jesus' words together. This is just one story he's telling. He is very clearly teaching at numerous, numerous other points that we, uh, we're saved not by what we do, but by putting our faith into him, by putting our trust into Christ and believing into him. That's where we're saved. But then there's also times when he talks about there's this inextricable link between our faith that's on the inside and how we actually live. Like you can't just say, oh yeah, I believe, but then do whatever you want. Our actions are signs and they're proofs of what's going on. And so... Um, there, the other reality thing, that's one side note. The other side note is there will be a separation. I think this is just so relevant for our society that um, we've forgotten this and we just always want to say, hey, you're okay and I'm okay and live your own truth and, and uh, you know, live however you want as long as you're true to yourself and maybe that's not true. Maybe there is a God who has claim to our lives. Maybe there's a God who Romans 1 says has actually put his laws upon our hearts that we know right from wrong. We know certain things aren't right. And so Jesus spoke often that a day of judgment is set. And one day he's going to judge this world, judge us. Um, and is there going to be a, a judgment in our lives that is fixed and it's final and it's fair. No one's going to be able to look at him and say, eh, what about, you know, you treated me wrong or you left out something got to add the one or whatever. No, it's going to be right. His judgment will be true. Jesus talked about this lots. His first followers, if you read about the Acts of the Apostles, they mentioned that in almost every sermon. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus is that there's, there's, there, there can be peace in the face of judgment. Why? God himself has been judged for us. That's what we believe the cross was. It was Jesus, God himself, taking upon himself God's righteous wrath there's no love without wrath, right? And, and at all the mistakes we've done, he said, hey, I'm going to pay for those. And, and everyone that believes in him, we are saved by grace, not by anything you have done. It is sheer mercy through faith, through putting your trust, your belief into him. But getting back to this story, um, Jesus said, look, there's going to be this separation. It's going to be like a shepherd doing his work putting the sheep into one pen, putting the goats in other pens. That for us might be like, I can't tell the difference. I'm a city, you know, city slicker, right? That's easy for a shepherd. His point was, this is going to be very easy. It's going to be evident. There is going to be defining marks and characteristics. And when Jesus said, one of the unmistakable marks of his followers is that they're going to care for the poor. They're going to be people who said, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me 
a drink. Jesus said that this is the way you're going to tell who my followers are. He gave us this vision of what his followers would be like. He said, my church, it's going to be like a city on a hill. It's going to be this brightly lit community that so contrasts with the world around them that, that it just holds out this hope for eternity, that, that one day in judgment we're, 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 there is a shelter, there is a mercy under the work of Christ on the cross, but also it's going to hold out hope for this world. And churches are going to be like these small foretastes of heaven in a decaying world, and they're going to be my redemptive agent that, that works and, and, and kind of is this foretaste of what one day I'm going to do over the whole earth. It's not perfect and it's broken, but we, we get glimpses of that in churches. If you've ever wondered why, uh, you know, Jesus leaves us around after we accept him and his forgiveness, it's because we get to be a part of this. We get to join his mission here on earth, and it's because we get to say this prayer, your kingdom come. This is like the Easy to recite. This is maybe the hardest prayer to pray you'll ever pray in your lifetime. Your will be done. Not mine. I got plans. I got desires. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, with that in mind, I just want to give you a little bit of a review. I've done this last couple years, and it's so refreshing for me to hear this. Why, why Malawi? You know, why... Um, there, uh, there's poverty here, and I know there is, and we're doing stuff to help uh, local partners, and we have supporting Westdale Food Bank and supporting local poverty, absolutely. But there's something different about extreme poverty. There's a great book that I've walked through through the last couple of years by a guy named Bryant James called Walking with the Poor, and he said, like, what is, what is this different? You know, why, why is extreme poverty something a little bit different than the poverty we know here? One of the things is um, hunger. Uh, we sometimes go through times of hunger, uh, uh, you know, probably not, like, we, we get hangry, okay? And if you're like uh, someone in my household, she hides um, <laughs> almonds, and I kind of told you that, that wasn't smart, right? But, like, there's, every time I open my glove box in the van, like, almonds fall out, right? And just, just in case, right? And so, we, we don't really know hunger, like, Long, prolonged hunger that we just don't know where our next meal is coming from. That, that's foreign to us, right? Not only is it hunger, ex, uh, extreme poverty is lack of good shelter. Um, you are often living with wildlife, and you're, you're exposed to mosquitoes. You're exposed to cockroaches. Uh, you're living among the elements, and so it's cold in winter, and you, you're living in sweat in summer. It's a lack of security, so that why am I going to ever accumulate tools? There's kind of a listlessness to get ahead, because that's just going to be stolen. I can't, I can't protect what I've owned. Uh, extreme poverty is poor sanitation. It's just reality, uh, kind of an unwritten rule, uh, is um, disease spreads quicker in, in uh, places of extreme poverty, because there just isn't the same sanitation. It's a lack of access to medical care. It's not long waits, which drives us crazy. It's no waits, because there is no access. Extreme poverty often means little or no education. One, because there just isn't access sometimes. Two, because uh, kids need to work. They need to help out and, and provide for their family. And it's little or no economic opp opportunities where, as that video shared, um, Malawi has like a, a lot of this number, but there's from um, the World Bank said just a few years ago that uh, over 750 million people live on less than $2 a day. And it's just, it's just hard to imagine trying to do that with rising food costs that's being reflected all over the world. Now, you take that, you take extreme poverty, but there's another equation here. It's an extreme poverty plus X. And X here is uh, you have a dismal situation like war or famine, natural disaster, HIV, AIDS, COVID pandemic. And Brian James said this, you take extreme poverty plus time and it leads to misery. It's just a level of misery and suffering that it just kind of becomes part of normal. It's just hard for us to even conceive. And then you take abject misery and you add that to time when that goes on for long enough and sometimes it's not just through your life, sometimes it's through generations. You don't live as long often in extreme, places of extreme poverty because you just don't have access to health and uh, health care and nutrition. Um, people, he said, be, sometimes begin to eternal, internalize the misery of life and they begin to think, maybe I, this is my lot in life. I've been relegated to just this uh, type of life and internalize the worthlessness. And, and so maybe even a missionary shows up with a message of, hey, there's incredible hope that you're, you are more loved than you could ever conceive. There's a God who knows all the details of your life. And that's hard to even register because you don't have uh, self-worth around that where you even have a context for that. And this is something that's got to move us. Jesus said one of the unmistakable marks of his followers is they're going to care for the poor and the people that the rest of the world kind of marginalizes. And so with that in mind, um, 
I want to read you some words that Paul of Tarsus writes to a young pastor that he is mentoring. And this guy's name is Timothy. And Timothy's in this place where he's pastoring a church of uh, rich people. And I'm struck by the relevance of this, this to us. And here's what he says. Chapter 6 of his first letter to Timothy that we have in the New Testament. Command those who are rich. Okay, so this is a command to rich people. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant. And you kind of want to say, how do you know? Like, is it a problem back then too, right? Well, command those who are rich in this present world not to think that their IQ goes up with their income, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. And it's just amazing how this is just so easy to do. It's just so easy to think, you know, I've got enough for retirement. I'm good. Now I'm safe. Now, you know, now I'm taken care of. He says, no, command those who are rich in this present world not to, to put their hope in wealth, but to put their hope in God. And this is great because he says he richly provides everything for our enjoyment. It's not wrong to enjoy some stuff. It's not wrong to have a nice meal. It's not wrong to have those things. But don't let that be the basis of your life. But let's not miss this. So he says, command those who are rich in this present world. Now, the problem with that is as soon as I say that, every one of you in this audience went, whoo, he's not talking to me, right? Because I'm not rich. Those people are rich. And it's amazing the sociological studies on this where everyone thinks, no, no, no. I'm not rich. It's the income bracket above me, you know. And, and yeah, we should raise taxes, but not on me. We should raise taxes on the people that start, you know, just above me. And, and globally speaking, if you have cash in the bank, if you're not spending all of your money day to day, you are doing better than most of the world. Um, at no point in history have so many people lived so well for so long as us in the, in the Western world. Again, from a global perspective. I'm not saying this is true from every one of us here, but speaking of averages, uh, this letter is absolutely written to us as rich people. And here's the command. He says, command those who are rich in this present world. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. This is a command to be rich and not just be average. The average Canadian gives less than $250 to anything beyond themselves annually. That's by their tax returns. That's money, you know, statistics you can find on Revenue Canada. All studies find that the richer you get, the less you give as a percentage of income. It should be the opposite, right? Where you need X to live, the more you make, you say, hey, I got more to be generous. But no studies find that. It's just so easy to get sucked into this vortex where uh, the Bible talks about the deceitfulness of wealth. That There's this thing, I don't know if you've found this, but I've found this where the more I have, the less I think I got. And just the more it is to be worried about money. Don't get sucked into the vortex of advertising in our society that says, it's all about you. It's all about you. Your money's all about you. Go beyond average generosity and give as only rich people can give. And it's with that in mind that I'm so excited to be able to talk to you about, about our ongoing partnership with Village of Hope, Malawi. And uh, be, before I share some of the details of what they're doing and what they've asked us to do to help, let me just show you a little video that will give you much greater context for what our church has been doing these last three years in Malawi, Africa. In the heart of Koma, on the outskirts of Malawi's capital city of Lilongwe, you will find Village of Hope, Malawi. Across the country of Malawi, more than half of the population is under 18 years old. And here in Koma live 33,000 people, the vast majority of them experiencing extreme poverty. This is where Village of Hope works towards their vision, that all children will be loved and cared for. The mission of Village of Hope is to bring lasting hope to orphans and vulnerable children by providing holistic and loving care, so these children can one day embrace adulthood as contributing members of society. More than 400 children are currently enrolled in the VOH program, so on a daily basis providing holistic love and care includes four essentials. Proper nutrition, health care, education, and spiritual discipleship. In 2019, we began our partnership with Village of Hope Malawi. 
Since then, we have invested $396,000 in infrastructure projects, including the new administration building, the first of four classroom blocks to be built, and the much needed security wall surrounding their entire property. Not only have your donations funded this construction, but these projects have also employed hundreds of local residents and contributed to the welfare of the entire community. We have also provided much needed financial, emotional and spiritual support to Jeff and Renata, their family and the entire staff at VOH Malawi. Your support allows them to focus on what they do best, providing loving care to the children and their families. And the best part of all, to date, you have sponsored 138 children to be a part of the VOH program. Not only that, but for the last two years, we've turned the tables and given the children of VOH the opportunity to choose you as their sponsor. Transformation doesn't happen overnight. And yet, there is incredible joy in being a part of the process and celebrating what has already been accomplished. There is still so much more to do, so many more children and families to reach with practical support and hope for the future. Maybe now is the time God is leading you to be a part of the transformation He is doing in our Oasis family and in the lives of everyone at VOH Malawi. Well, what an incredible privilege to be able to talk to you about uh, Village of Hope Malawi. And uh, let me just restate some of the things we went over quickly there for just one moment. Um, it, this is a charity that cares for orphans and vulnerable children. They currently, as an organization, have 10 villages in five different African countries, and they do four things. They do uh, nu nutrition and food for not only just the children, but it, sometimes that spills over into your family. You got some shots of them bringing home chickens to their, their family there. Uh, do education. Uh, they also provide health care, and they help out with that in a place there's not much access, and they also give spiritual care. Here's a shot of Troy from our team who was there uh, just before the pandemic in 2009 to just uh, check out everything that's going on. This organization is the real deal. They do what they say, and they say what they do, and we, we stand before you with confidence that uh, all the resources that we entrust to them are being well, well used. Now, just to step back for a bit for context, I'm sure all of us can find Malawi on a map, but for the one or two of us who can't, uh, this is where we are in the world, okay? Um, where we're working is in the capital city of Lilongwe. This is Lake Malawi. It's one of the largest lakes in the world. Most of their country borders that lake. And we're in an area of um, Lilongwe called Kauma, which is one of the poorest nations, uh, sort of the, the poorest uh, area of the city. And as Troy said, there are an incredible amount of people there, over half are children and uh, areas of incredible needs. The directors are Jeff and Renata Walton. Jeff was with us in 2009. Some of you will remember that. They are with us. If you are online, welcome to them. They are on the online chat. And this is a shot of their team. And uh, we've been able to offer some help, but we're also learning, and we're receiving help back from them as we pray for one another. And uh, we've just asked them in the number of years that we've been a partner, hey, we don't know, you know what's going on. You know what you need. What can we do? How, how can we help? And as the video mentioned, at the end of 2019, we gave uh, over $130,000 to build their new administration building that you saw being so well used there. This is a cornerstone building that just uh, is able to serve their community. It beautifully built. At the end of 2020, they said, hey, what do you need? Uh, we said, hey, what do you need? And they said, hey, we need next year's classroom. And you can see these classrooms are built. There's actually a double classroom building. There's one on each side. And so you guys gave to do that. And then last year, at the end of 2021, we said, hey, what do you need? And they said, hey, we really need a security fence. We need a wall. And we did this. We, we built this. Um, I, I kind of felt like I was raising money like a certain politician to build a wall. But, you know, hey, 
I, I wasn't sure what happened. It was $215,000. I was like, this is crazy. But we did it. And they said, hey, we got, we got people driving cars through soccer games when the kids are out playing games. We got people stealing stuff right off our desk as they walk by the buildings. We got vandalism. People had started fires in their lot. They're destroying our trees. And so we said, hey, you, you know better than us. And so um, $135,000 went to build the wall around uh, well, four and a half acres, which I have no clue how they did it so well at that price. Another 80000 went to uh, retention of ground and water where they just had some real erosion going and this is now complete and you can see here in this next image that it's just so well built and people can see in while also giving some security and um, again this year we said how, how can we help what, what do you need and they came back with, with four areas of potential help one of those is once again child sponsorship where for $41 a month your giving goes to help a child uh, in this area get education uh, health care, nutrition, a school uniform, it pays for the teachers, and you're able to sign up for that today. In the foyer, as you leave to uh, your left, as you walk out, there's areas where you can um, sign up for that. If you're online, there's a button you can click. If you're watching live, if you're watching later, uh, you'll have to go to our website for that. But um, if you're here today, they'd prefer for you to go in person, because once again, like that video showed, we need to do reverse sponsorship. As the uh, school year has been delayed again just because of COVID, they will be getting things back into order in coming years so that uh, we'll probably be able to pick a child to sponsor in future years. For this year, we're still doing it reverse. So they'll take your photo this morning, or they'll get one from you if you sign up online and send it away, and the children will pick you, and so they'll choose who their sponsor will be. And... Um, uh, we have been doing this now for uh, three years, and Oasis currently has 207 people sponsoring 138 kids. All of the kids are double sponsored. It costs more like $82 a month to provide everything that uh, Village of Hope does. And some people take the full sponsor, they take double, others just take one. Um, my hope is that as a class is added year upon year, that we, we would do as much as we can to support these children. And uh, we get first uh, opportunity to do that before they pass that on to other people that help around the world as well. Another way to help uh, is to give to financially to year-end projects as well. And we, each year, we bring before you at year-end some things to prayerfully consider. Just look back on your year, think about how God has been good to you. And once again, we said to them, hey, what do you need? How can we help? They need another classroom. This is a photo of the classroom we built two years ago. They now need space for the grade sevens and eights as the sixes move up. And so the cost of this is $75,000. Anything you give towards this is marked VOH projects. Um, and you know, the good news is that we've actually already have in commitments and cash received throughout the years. People, you know, you knew this is coming. We actually already have $70,000 for this. And so we went back to Jeff Renata and said, hey, like, chances are this money may come in. We don't want to presume upon our church, but this may come in. What do you need next? And they suggested, hey, we really need a community hall. Uh, that This is a, something that would be open air, that have some closed space also. You can't see it super well here, but that'd be for cooking and for s storage. The solar panels to supply uh, their facility with, with electricity. And um, <clears throat> So we'll see it. I said 750 people. And as a school, you need to realize that they are required to feed the children in a dedicated space that is not their classroom. As you saw from the video, that's not what's happening. They are feeding them right in the classrooms. And thankfully, up to this point, the Malawian government has been lenient with them. I don't know how long that will go on for. And so they, they need a space where this can happen. And not only is it used for feeding, it becomes a space where uh, a gathering space for the community. where They are able to gain influence as they host things here using this space. And each week, there are, there are kids at, at all times that can't get into Village of Hope. They want to, but there's just not space in the school. And so they host a kids' church every weekend, and all the kids of the area are invited. And as you saw from that photo of Troy, they are currently crammed into a current space. This gives them space to bring the message of Christ to so many other children that just can't, can't get into the school and sometimes can't even fit in the things that they're doing on the weekends for everyone. Now, I know some of you have good questions on this, and so we have printed off full architectural engineering drawings that you can get from uh, Troy or anyone working at those uh, um, uh, the, the the tables out in the foyer today, and you can mark any giving for that VOH project. This is I want to just let you know this is an artist rendition. I forgot to say that uh, this looks like it's built. It's not. It's just a very good drawing of that, and uh, their hope and desire is that something like that would would be built. Please recognize that God can multiply even meager gifts. 
I, I pray that every Sunday when I come up here to speak. Say, I, God, I, I've done the best I can, but I've got a few loaves and a few fish. It's not enough to feed your people. Multiply this. And God does that with our resources too. Somehow, I don't know how, but the transformation that's happening through our one church, we can't do everything, but we can do something. We can do something in this poorest part of the world. Third way to help, short-term missions trips. And I know I've been talking about that for years, and COVID's kind of set things back as Malawi was a closed country for many years. Part of the reason for that is the reason why some of you need to go. In a country of uh, 18 million people, they only have 300 doctors. And so if you have healthcare experience, you can do incredibly good by going there on a short-term trip. Even if you just like working with kids and want to go over there, uh, sign up for that today, and we'll put you on a list to let you know of more information when we actually are able to go there. One last way, a fourth way to help, supporting Jeff and Renata Walton, who are the leaders there. They are a Canadian family. Uh, if you want to sign up today, you can do that also at the foyer. They'll give you a card for more information. If, if you want to uh, give to them financially, if you want to pray for them as a family. Regarding um, things like this, some people ask a good question. like, how much money actually goes to the kids? And, and here the answer is 100%, because the missionaries, like Jeff and Renata, raise their own support. And maybe that's you. Maybe God's speaking to you about helping them as they lead. An essential part of every person who says that Jesus is my leader, essential, essential part of that journey as we become like him is, is serving the poor. It's going to help you grow. It's going to do something in your heart where you receive more than you give. Some weird arithmetic of God's kingdom where that happens. In giving, we receive. In pouring out, we are filled up. And G, excuse me, Paul writes to disciples who are on this journey and he says, command those who are rich in this present world, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, to be generous and willing to share. And he says, if you do this, if you actually follow through and you don't just hear this and go on to your thing, in this way they will lay up treasure for themselves. Treasure is something that actually matters eternally. This is something that is actually going to make it out of this age that is passing away. Treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. All of us get to gamble with our life. Is it really going to be life found by the advertising slogans where it says it's all about you, you know, and just spend it all on you? Some of you have tried that, and it doesn't work. Celebrities we see try that. They put semi-loads of everything this world can offer into their heart and into their life, and then they say, I'm still hungry. It's not enough. It's not, it's not filling me up. Jesus said there's another way. You receive my grace, and then you go and give the same way you've received. Give as freely as you've received, and it will fill you with meaning. It will fill you with life that is truly life. That's my prayer for us as a church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thanks for your patience with us. Thanks for, you know, we're all somewhere here where it's just so easy to... Uh, live for ourselves. It's so easy to um, get caught up in the messaging of this world that says, put yourself first. Live for yourself. Meet every hunger of all the advertising for more and more and more that's in our world, and uh, we're, we're caught up in that. And uh, I pray that you'd open our eyes to where that path leads. I pray that you'd show us a better way. I pray that you would... Um, Help us to be a people that follow in your footsteps of putting others first. Just like you put us first, now we are freed up to serve others with this incredible kindness and generosity that's been expressed to us in Jesus and the cross. So uh, speak to us today about what we can do, about bringing justice to this world where there's a whole lot of injustice, about um, bringing good news to the poor. That's what your gospel is. It was announced as good news to the poor. And may that be true of us as your followers, I pray. Amen.
So come, move, let justice roll on like a river. Let worship turn into revival. Lord, lead us back to you. When you justice roll on. Be rich in good deeds. That's our hope and prayer for today. We invite you back next week as we kick off our Advent series around here. It's going to be great. But before you leave today, I have this uh, prayer for you, this blessing. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer pain, rejection, hunger, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them, to turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe you can make a difference in the world, so that you can do what others claim cannot be done, to bring justice and kindness to all our children and to the poor. Amen. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Have a great weekend.